Welcome back to 21st Century Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Bob Hieronymus, our executive producer and research assistant, Laura Cordner, and our engineer is Anita Brockington. Well, tonight's guest is Stephen Sora, and we're talking about Rosicrucian America, how a soci- secret, secret, excuse me, secret society influenced the destiny of a nation, and it's by Destiny Books. As a matter of fact, I was asked to give a review of this book, and I'm going to read it now because I don't know if, um, Stephen, I don't know if you saw my review of your book. Yes, I did, and I appreciate it. Well, let's, let, me, let me tell people what I said about it and why I was so excited. What fun I had reading this book. Stephen Sora has connected so many of my favorite topics into one woven tale that I found it a real page-turner. For 50 years, I've been studying the German pietists of provincial Pennsylvania, the authorship question of William Shakespeare, the far-reaching influence of Sir Francis Bacon and Sir John Dee, and William Penn's hidden reasons for coming to America, among other topics in this book. But it took Stephen Sora to flesh it all out with the latest research and put it all together in one brilliant volume. Like the alchemical goal of a Rosicrucian, this book will transmute your appreciation for the destiny of America. Congratulations. Thanks, Bob. You're welcome. You're very welcome. You know, I get accused sometimes of throwing in the kitchen sink, and uh, I have a um, handful of other stories that I came across. One is the murder of William Shakespeare. Shakespeare um, and Walter Raleigh were both um, not people that got along. Bacon was writing Shakespeare to point out that Walter Riley might be an atheist and uh, anti-government and things like that. So they threw uh, Walter Riley in jail. He was in there for years, and uh, then um, Shakespeare was turning, I think, 56. He he decided for the first time in his whole life to write a will. So uh, Ben Johnson, who is the poet laureate of England, he was taking care of uh, Walter Raleigh's son, and uh, he basically taught him how to drink and have <laughs> brawls in the street and things like that. And uh, I always thought a poet, Laurie, was a peaceful guy. Ben J- Johnson killed someone with his bare hands one day. But anyway, so uh, they uh, got a hold of Shakespeare, and they said that they want to come up and celebrate his birthday. Now, Shakespeare didn't really know that Johnson was in the Raleigh camp, and that Johnson had been taking care of who they called Watt Riley. So uh, they come up, they have dinner, uh, the, uh, they supposedly eat and drink a lot, and Shakespeare dies. And uh, so some people think he was poisoned. And Raleigh, who had just got out of pr- prison, was staying in the next town from uh, where this dinner occurred. Well, was that was J- Raleigh in jail for fifteen years? Is that 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 because he was? Yeah, in- and he was only let out then to um, to take some military action, which uh, he failed to listen to what his orders were. And uh, so when he came, his son died in the operation. When he came back, uh, he was executed. Oh, I think what we need right now is a little history of Sir Walter Raleigh himself, because he becomes a super important person in this book, doesn't he? Yeah, he he is. His, um, I think his group is the um, School of Night, and whether they were atheists or not, uh, he was accused of being an atheist, and, and that really hurt. But at at one point, he had the favor of the queen. He was the person that he put down his cape by a puddle so the queen could step over it, Hold that. and he was considered a gentleman. But um, then he got married to one of the ladies in waiting which um, she had told him specifically that he can't marry. And uh, so that was the first time he went into the tower. But um, when (laughs) King James came along, uh, he was the one that put him in uh, prison for a long sentence. Well, if it weren't for the queen putting him in, somebody else is going to put him in. He had a tough time. And he did so many things, so many more important. What do you think the most important thing Sir Walter Raleigh did besides all of his great voyages and things? Uh, I'm going to guess it was uh, the different uh, trips to Virginia that he sponsored. But um, 
Also, his writings, um, he wrote a book that it was like a Bible of uh, the world history, but um, with creatures that, you know, weren't known in any religion. Um, so he, he was um, a learned man. And he, uh, he put together the School of Night? Yep. Could you tell us more about the School of Night? Well, basically, there were like two or three groups, and um, they met at different estates, and uh, the, um, they gathered people that um, were considered alchemists and whatever and writers, and, uh, and the group could speak freely among themselves, um, but they were rivals with each other for the attention of the queen, and uh, so they weren't always, you know, running on the same line. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. The uh, the one that um, Bacon was in, uh, Athena was the shaker of the spear. So uh, when um, Marlowe introduced Bacon to uh, William Shakespeare, he must have thought, okay, now we have our uh, bag man. <laughs> he could uh, be, even though he's a butcher's apprentice, um, he could be the person that fronts the different plays. Now, in other areas of your book, I, I found fun, in, much more interesting than, uh, well, it was this area, the, the famous astronomer Johannes Kepler believed that geometry is God himself. How so? What did he mean by that? Um, the... Uh forget the name of the saint. Um, one saint said the same thing, basically, that um, God is actually geometry. And uh, the, um, I guess, basically, he's, you know, what holds up the universe. It kind of reminds me of the, the Greek philosophers that some of them would say all things are number, all things are vibration, all things are this, all things are that. That's, you know, that kind of thing. Um, what is the true quest of the grail? Uh, that's up for debate. Uh, a lot of people would just say it's, it's the chalice. Uh, other people say it's the alchemical um, success that uh, I think it was Flood who claimed to have um, been able to convert metals on uh, January 17th of one year and, uh, and that this transformation uh, would be like the quest. The um, other people would say it's just the tr uh, transformation of yourself. I just watched um, a documentary supposedly on the initiation into the Rosicrucian order, and that's basically what um, the Grail quest was. You'd also note that um, no institution or authority, no intermediary can succeed in the spiritual journey, which I think was super important uh, because obviously the, there wasn't much freedom in any of this. Most people were either, well, if if, uh, if you were Catholic, you were going to have a hard time in England, especially around the time period of, uh, of Elizabeth, etc. Uh, and, and, uh, but it got better. It was after James I, right? James I was Catholic, was he not? Am I wrong? Yes, and that was another problem that we were going from uh, the Protestant Church of Elizabeth to mm -hmm. the Catholic Church of James. And uh, this brought up, uh, for some reason, Bacon was elevated when James came in, which um, I thought was kind of the opposite of what might be. Yeah, yeah. Why do you think? It didn't... I think there, there might have been a fallout between Bacon and the Queen, and there might have been... Um, same thing. D was uh, also protected by the queen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The Oracle of Delphi was known, th known, excuse me, was know thyself. Why is self-awareness important to the transformation of consciousness? There's a small question for you. I think it's important because if you don't really um, understand yourself and your own um, feelings and goals and whatever, it's hard to uh, 
make any progress. You're only, you know, yeah. following by example um, others who tell you what to do. Yeah, I think the whole quote is, uh, let's see, man know thyself, presume not God to scan the, oh, that last sentence. Oh, the proper study of mankind is man. Jeez, oh whiz. I almost got it right. That's about a C plus for you mm. on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but it was very close to it. So what's the connection between the Knights Templar and the Rosicrucian tradition? Um, I think the philosophy of the whole thing. The Knights Templar were one of the first democratic orders that um, smaller groups would be able to elect their leader rather than have somebody else elected. And, uh, and so by having this uh, philosophical uh, ability, the... Um, it transferred into Rose Freemasons for one, and uh, Rosicrucianism for another. Would you say that that Rosicrucianism, Rosicrucianism is is uh, different from from uh, uh, secret other secret societies? Uh, because oh my lord, it just slipped my mind. Darn it! I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It was something I've been trying to remember for some time. Yes, last hour, but I couldn't get it, pick it up. I but, think it, the whole thing is that people denied being Rosicrucians, um, although not to each other. I think they would just defend each other for not being in a secret order. Uh, they wouldn't have a membership list. Now that there's two large orders of Rosicrucians in the United States, and the one that's in California. They do publish the member names, and that's something that uh, didn't happen before. Then there's a secretive one in Pennsylvania that um, you can't go on the property. They don't hand out literature, and they won't tell you who's a member. Wow. What part of Pennsylvania is that? Uh, it's in the Bucks County area. Oh. Hmm. I had no idea. Jeez, who is? The, uh, how did Bacon... And his circle uh, of, fel of fellow esoteric thinkers find England's explorations in the New World. I better read. Um, in a lot of ways, the uh, one of Bacon's closest members was the Earl of Southampton. Uh, he put up a lot of money. Uh, Newfoundland was explored by um, Bacon's group, and you remember his making a joke about the. Bacon names like hog money and things like that. Yeah. Uh, Newfoundland still has a hog on a, a coin uh, celebrating uh, Bacon's discovery or his sponsorship of finding Newfoundland. Uh, Virginia was a biggie, and uh, after Raleigh's explanations, uh, the company of Virginia was taken over by a hand of people that were in the Bacon Circle. And uh, so they really covered a, a lot of territory, and um, although it was not always for the same reasons. They um, they were not looking for gold. They were looking to populate um, the country. They're, they were looking to establish the new Atlantis? Yep. That's what they were here for. Yeah. When James Wilmot decided to write a biography on Shakespeare, what did he find? Um, basically nothing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and, <laughs> Like a whole it, it bunch kind of, of others. shocked them that there were, there were no books in the town practically, and that um, people didn't really have um, any respect for him. And his second favorite writer was Bacon, and so uh, somewhere along the way he just uh, discovered that that's the way that it should be rather than uh, worry about Shakespeare. And then uh, there was like a plaque to, towards um, Shakespeare that at first it had a man with a book on it, in in a church in Stratford, and then later it was changed to a man with a sack of grain. No, actually, it's, I got that backwards. It, it was a man with a sack of grain, meaning that the real William Shakespeare was now a merchant in his retirement mm -hmm. and when he died, uh, and then they changed it to make it a, a popular place to go on a pilgrimage, and it became a man with a book in his hand. I found that amazing. I really did, especially that sack of grain. <laughs> it looked, mm. like, it looked like a heavy pillow or something like that. that well, he talked about, you know, the certain ideals in the writings of Shakespeare, which were not like William Shakespeare at all, that he was a greedy person and, and all that. So uh, that was another thing that Wilmot um, looked at. 
Well, we have to take a break right now. I'm with our guest, Stephen Sora, Rosicrucian America, How a Secret Society Influenced the Destiny of a Nation, Destiny Books, available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and innertraditions.com. Hi, I'm Jason Louv, real life wizard and author of John D and the Empire of Angels. You can find out more about me and magic at jasonlouv.com. And you're listening to 21st Century Radio with Bob Hieronymus. Oh, welcome back there. And our guest, of course, is Stephen Sora, Rose Christian America, how a secret society influenced the destiny of a nation, destiny books, and yes, we want you to get a copy of this book so you can educate yourself in this particular area, which most people think they know all about this, but they don't. <laughs> and this is one of the important works. By the way, um, I would like to do this. Anyone here that's in our audience or not even in our audience, and you buy a copy of this book, and you can prove it to us, we will send you any book that we've ever written or any book that we have left over for over the past oh it's close to going into almost 40 years now that we've been doing this uh and that way we make sure we can educate folks out there because that's what we all of us need to learn a hell of a lot more about this particular area are you with us yes okay how was being homosexual in the 21st century quite different from how it was perceived in the 16th century. I was shocked by this. It, um, it was accepted as being um, an alternate lifestyle, but uh, people that were homosexual would still be married. And uh, the person that took over the role of Sir Francis um, Bacon's mother, rather than the queen, was, um, she was concerned with that Bacon was sleeping with men, and uh, so she wrote to um, Bacon's brother, uh, Anthony Bacon, that, uh, you know, be careful that he doesn't get in trouble. Sodomy was still out illegal, but homosexuality was not. And I'm not sure I understand that. But the, uh, Anthony um, never said anything to Francis because Anthony also was homosexual. So it was much more accepted. Bacon himself was not married till. I think he was 50-something, and he ma married a teenager. So um, he had other companions along the way. Yeah, that's for sure. Thank you. In 1611, the King James Version of the Bible was translated and edited by Bacon. Uh, and, and Bacon had, excuse me, a field day planting cryptic coded messages. Could you give us a few examples of what some of those coded messages might be? Um, in a lot of cases, he'd have his own name written on a page, like the first sentence would start with B, the second would start with A, C-O-N. Uh, he'd have diagonal uh, ways of putting his name in there. And uh, the halfway through the book, exactly, uh, his name was there also. So like whatever, 150 pages from the front, 150 pages to the back, middle of that page, um, would have the name Bacon. So um, he just was letting people know for all eternity, I think, that uh, it was him. I'm sure you've seen so many of the other uh, theories and psychics, uh, uh, excuse me, theories dealing with uh, hidden meanings and things like that within, within uh, uh, ba uh, not just the Bible, but, but in all of uh, Bacon's work and other things. But... Uh, is there any, did Bacon, wait, did he die on April 9th, 1626, or was that a fake death? There's actually three theories. One is that he did die um, in the church where he supposedly is buried. There's a depiction of him with a hat on. And uh, what's funny about that is they didn't allow hats in church. Uh, so maybe that was like a tip-off that he's not, it's not really him. There's another story that he went to Holland, 
Holland was like kind of the stepping off point for a lot of the Protestant groups that were in, uh, especially Germany, and uh, and so that he went to Leiden and in Holland and died, and then the third is that he uh, came to Virginia, and um, Virginia was probably his biggest project, and he still he has Athena on the uh, Virginia flag to this day. Um, they said that he lived to be over a hundred in Virginia. Wow, that'd be a nice place to live over a hundred too. <laughs> wow, yeah. Uh, was where where was Bacon's final resting place? Uh, that would be hard to say if if, uh, if he actually did um, die in London and he is in the church there. Um, the hat could just be kind of a a personal joke, just like you know. He didn't listen to every, what everybody told him. He just did what he wanted, and so that's why someone put, placed a hat on his head. Um, that would be most likely. Uh, Holland would be a big possibility, though, because um, he wouldn't need to escape to Holland uh, because he was in favor with James, but um, it just um, might have meant he was with more of the pe- people he represented, Rosicrucian-type people and um, whatever. Mm-hmm. Well, you had a, have a great deal on here in this book on dealing with Christopher Marlowe and very, very many sections here. Uh, Christopher Marlowe, uh, let's see, did he, did Christopher Marlowe write any of Shakespeare's works? Um, he wrote The Jew, Jew of Malta, which was kind of crude, and some people would say more racist, um, whereas... Then the book was rewritten again, and uh, so he might have done that. I don't know of any specific work that he wrote, but um, he did. Spe- he wrote for, about um, things that happened in Italy, which um, Shakespeare was never in Italy and, and wouldn't have known these things. Marlowe is a really interesting story because um, he was uh, a spy for Walsington. Francis Walsington was the Queen's. Uh, spy master, and this goes back to Eaton Fleming, that um, he wrote letters to um, the Queen as M. Um, D chose the number uh, of Walsington, 007 was um, his code name, and a lot of times on top of the envelope, he would write for your eyes only. So there's a lot of um, connections Fleming to... Um, to the D group. But anyway, um, Christopher Marlowe was also a loose cannon, and he um, was considered someone that, that was being investigated and uh, with a party of three or four other people. So people thought he would never get tortured like um, his friend Thomas Kidd was. Thomas Kidd was a group before confessed under torture about the other three. So, uh, so uh, he was in a restaurant, Supposedly there was a fight over the bill. Marlowe got stabbed in the eye and died. But um, there's people that believe that they just dug up another body and made a substitute, and Marlowe went to live in uh, Italy. And later there was a doctor that um, wrote a letter to somebody saying that he kind of helped the dying care of Marlowe years later. So... uh, Marlowe was important in one way or the other. I just don't know a fan which um, ones that are attributed to him. Mm-hmm. Another fake death, or or it kind of reminds me of the stories about Hitler, with the I, right. I don't know if you've. I guess you probably have seen the one photograph of him in South America. Uh, whether that's him or not, I, I can't basically say, but it sure as hell looked like it. Uh, that, but that's a whole other story. What am I getting that for? Uh, did Marlowe die on May 30th, 1593? No, there's a good chance he, um, his death was fake and he went on to go to, uh, Italy. So again, we have a lot of fake deaths, uh, for specific reasons here. And then we come into a, a third person that I spent a lot of time, uh, checking into, Edward de Vere. Can you please tell us about Edward de Vere? Uh, this is an extraordinary soul as far as I'm concerned and, and how he's written, possibly written something that Shakespeare may have written. 
he was one of the persons that went to school uh, where Bacon did. He went to Gray's Inn at Cambridge. His father was um, the homosexual partner of Richard III, and uh, he was the nephew of um, a person named Golding who wrote, rewrote a lot of like Latin texts and things like that. He was a Catholic sympathizer um, until he had a fall, falling out with the church, and uh, he died June 24th, uh, St. John's Day, in 1604. Um, is that definite? I believe so. Okay. I haven't heard anything different. Okay. Uh, the uh, De Vere, I thought, after I did my reading of some of his works, I, I felt almost inclined to think that he could have been more involved uh, as much as, say, for instance, uh, uh, Bacon. What, is that possible? Um, it is. He was fluent in French and Italian. He traveled extensively, and um, he was certainly one of the more learned people in the Elizabethan circle. I'm going to sum, sum, summar, summarize something here that I... Uh, to make the point about Bacon here, that the theory that Bacon wrote the Shakespeare plays is supported by the understanding that none of the known facts of Shakespeare's life qualifies him to write the texts attributed to him, and at the same time, everything about the life of Bacon qualifies him to have the necessary intellectual means as well as the necessary motive to do so. And to date, as you note, there have been over 4,000 books that refute Shakespeare as the creator of Shakespeare's work. What would you like to say to that? Uh, I agree wholeheartedly, and a lot of people that believe that Shakespeare couldn't have written those works um, a learned people like Mark Twain and, oh, and others. Yes. And um, as far as the traveling, the person that wrote Shakespeare, um, whether it was Bacon or somebody else, would have been fluent in different languages. And even more importantly, um, they knew of the slang used in Cambridge, which um, William Shakespeare couldn't have obviously went to Cambridge. Then um, he was aware of different sports, um, yeah, there's a whole list of things that... Um, Especially that language situation, how many languages um, that he would have had to have known to write these plays. Right. And and obviously, if you have a person like we, the person we call Shakespeare, we have that particular person who doesn't, can't write. We have no letters from him. We have, well, excuse me, we have five or eight, eight, is it eight or seven or eight? Uh, different um, things that uh, how I signed his name and it was only one letter that he signed it's almost like making your ex uh, so th that and that's the best he could do and, and it just seems to me to be totally ridiculous to think that this guy could have done these plays but it I think <laughs> it's going to take a very long time uh, for people to be accept this accept this and it's unfortunate because they're, you know, we are given a kind of a plastic history here, which uh, has no credibility at all, and yet people make a great deal over this particular man uh, that we call Shakespeare. So I'm, I'm a little bit unhappy about that, as you can tell. You know, there's a person named Mary Sidney. She was the Countess of Pembroke, and she married Herbert, which was in the circles. Uh, he was the Earl of Pembroke. Um, she was the daughter of Sir Henry Sidney and the sister of Philip and Robert Sidney. She was a favorite of Elizabeth, um, Queen Elizabeth, who visited her a lot at the Pembroke Estate, which they called the Wilton House. And uh, she sponsored uh, Spencer, John Davies, Michael Drayton, uh, Samuel Daniel, and um, she just was learned enough to do all these things. She went bowling. <laughs> <laughs> I would have loved to have seen that. <laughs> um, she could ride horseback. She could hunt from horseback. And uh, one of her letters to her son was, we have the man Shakespeare here. And so it's, it's a mystery. Uh, Shakespeare wouldn't have been there, number one. And number two, 
who who were they calling Shakespeare? So it's uh, another thing you may never find out, but it's kind of interesting. Sure, yeah, there's a lot of loose ends around these things. How was Dr. John D? Oops, time out for a break. Time out on the playing field for a break on 21st Century Radio and with our interview with Stephen Sora of Rosicrucian America, How a Secret Society Influenced the Destiny of a Nation, Destiny Books. Do you think you know America's history? I bet you don't. I bet most people don't. Uh, it's available at Amazon and Barnes & Noble as well as innertraditions.com. And uh, don't forget, our archives are also posted weekly for free on iTunes and on our YouTube channel. Hi, this is Dr. Greg Little, co-author of Denisovan Origins. You're listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Bob Hieronymus. This is an incredible show with a great purpose, and I encourage you to not only listen, but to get others to also listen to it. Yeah, that way you can learn stuff. (laughs) That's why we do this. That's why I do this show. I like to learn stuff. And I hope you'd like to learn your stuff. Hey, by the way, there you go with a little bit of McNaughton there again. Did I mention that uh, Philip Glass is finally going to be at the Met? Uh, Wow. We were so thrilled to have him on the show after we were only like three months into 21st Century Radio. Never expected to get Philip Glass on, but we did. That's most unusual. Okay, so go celebrate that because there's he's going to be very big especially with History Channel all over again, because there's all kinds of things coming out about that. Now, our guest, of course, is Stephen Mussora, Rosicrucian America, How Our Secret Society Influenced the Destiny of a Nation, Destiny Books, and I've already told you, if you can prove to me that you purchased a copy of this book, you can have your choice of any book, DVD, or one that we've done over the past 38 years or something like that, maybe it's closer to 40. Uh, we still got lots of those books. And we actually give away libraries, especially we set up libraries for schools and we give out libraries to those people that are in prison. That's uh, one of my great joys of being able to to see uh, libraries go out to prisons where you find people in bars who are absolutely uh, perhaps the, one of the, some of the most unhappiest. You know, they may, may have smoked a joint and got thrown in jail. Now, figure that out. Okay. How was John, Dr. John D. the catalyst that initiated England's settling of the American continent? We touched on this a little last time. Probably hour. the num- number one thing was that he wrote a book called The Art of Navigation. And uh, this book was used by Martin Frobisher. Um, it incorporated ideas from Mercator. And uh, so he had an influence on a lot of the people that did uh, eventually sponsor trips or take trips to America. Yeah, yeah, uh, especially settling, uh, you know, because this is the new Atlantis, and that's what basically Dr. John D. was to do. He was doing the job of, of Sir Francis Bacon. Would you, could you say it that way? Yeah, there is there's a, a famous woodcut that shows um, a wizard-looking man, which would be John D., uh, standing over a hole in the ground, passing a lamp to another guy that looks like an English gentleman, which people believe is Bacon. So um, when when D was getting to the point that um, he was actually afraid for his life, um, he handed the torch to Bacon, and uh, and so Bacon carried out the works of settling Virginia and, and Bermuda and Newfoundland. Mm-hmm. And you note that to understand the role of whales. Now, this this was an excellent area of your book because, in the stuff, the research that I've done, there is some kind of relationship to whales and uh, Native Americans, and and you get right to that. But so you note that the to understand the role of whales is to understand the true history of Britain. Could you please explain? I learned a great deal in this area. Yeah, the, the people of Wales are basically the, the real English, 
and um, the Britons, and the people that came over as Vikings, like the Angles, uh, became the English. And uh, there's still some people that really resent being called English. Uh, they believe they're Britons. And um, I forget which king it was, but they actually banned the Welsh language, and kids would be caned in school for speaking Welsh, and they just tried to stamp it out completely. But um, And they did a good job in a lot of cases, probably with Legends of King Arthur and, and, uh, and other personages. You note that to understand the role of whales is to understand the true history of, as I mentioned, I, this is a question I asked, but but could you tell us a little bit more about the difference between Britain, England, and et cetera? Because I'm, I'm very confused in this particular area. Well, Britons were the original people, and they were pushed by people from Denmark, um, the Angles and the Saxons. Uh, they were they pushed the real Britons into Wales, and uh, this is like 1,500 years ago, and so, um, and that's why there is that big difference. Mm -hmm. Well, I've always been interested in in that particular language, especially since uh, there are certain Native Americans that that seem to be speaking Welsh. Is that correct? Uh, without a doubt, the, there's a lot of people that encountered. People, when they came to America, that they said they described them as Welsh, blue eyes, Welsh words in their language, uh, fair skin, and uh, it, it could have been a lot of different people. I, I believe that people from um, the Bay of Biscay, uh, from Portugal, from, uh, of course, Scandinavia, all came here. It's just nobody came on official voyages that were sanctioned by kings and queens. They came for fish, and they came for lumber. And so um, it, it shouldn't be any surprise that they had the ability to sail then. There's one boat that they found in Denmark. I think it goes back to 2000 B.C., and it was a boat that could fit like 20 people in it. So um, the, uh, the possibility of long-range fishing and exploring and trading and things like that is definitely present. In, um, in Montauk, they found that the... Native Americans there, the Montauk tribe, was actually deep sea fishing, and they could uh, catch whales, which just unbelievable that uh, we don't give any of these people any credit for that kind of thing. That's right. You know, the, the, for some reason, it's very difficult for many people, uh, researchers, uh, to say things like it's not possible for anyone. Uh, well, let me put it this way. We have interviewed people to tell the stories of people almost sitting in a bathtub almost on the coast of of Africa and following certain currents they just it it's a natural thing to just come to across the, across the ocean and uh, uh into America it's 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 really sad that we think that they just could not do that when they did and we still do it now People were still doing that kind of thing. One person in a little, in a little craft. I think it just happened a couple of weeks ago, crossing the, the Atlantic. Uh, so why in the world wouldn't they, other people, be able to do that? I don't. I, you know, I think it's a miserable kind of thinking. Of course, I'm biased. Columbus was obviously not the first to discover America. What can you share with us about the Irish Saint Brendan, and then after that maybe Prince Madoc? St. Brendan was one that he wrote a book um, about his voyages, and uh, it definitely looks like he did the circle around the Atlantic using the currents, and he, he wrote things about uh, fiery mountains, which might maybe Iceland. Uh, he wrote about milky rocks, which could have been iceberg, and uh, it just, because of those things, it was considered too fantastic. But he had been following... Uh, a voyage by another Welsh monk. And then um, Maddock was um, definitely capable. I mean, he had his own navy and thousands of people, and he came over one trip, and I, I think they went up to Mississippi, and he sent ships back, and they brought a whole bunch of other people from Wales. Um, there was a plaque on the Mississippi River for the longest time. I think they just took it down, but uh, saying how he colonized the uh, Mississippi. And... Um, 
he went as far as North Dakota where there was a um, tribe that I can't think of now. Uh, people, oh, the Mandan. Oh, the Mandan. Oh, yes. Blue Excuse eyes me. and things like that. And uh, unfortunately, most of them got wiped out by disease. And uh, But uh, it just sounds true that he was in the south of the Mississippi River and all the way uh, past the north. Can you tell us a little bit more about the Mandan? Because I, I found them very fascinating. Um, I don't know too much about them. There's a person named George Maitland, uh, Caitlin, who is a painter that um, he came over here and he painted people of different races and uh, different scenery that he saw. And he was the one that wrote the most description on the tribe and their villages and everything else. The Rosicrucian guidelines are laid out in a Stonehenge-like setting in Georgia. They say their goal is to have a global population of 500 million. What yeah, that is... shouldn't make the other six and a half billion of us feel safe. <laughs> <laughs> you mean they're going to forget about us, huh? <laughs> uh, so we'll have nothing but Rosicrucians in this country. Well, I mean, they definitely sound like Rosicrucian ideals. Uh, the person that put up the money for it was a guy named R.C. Christian, as in Rosa Christian. Um, he visited a granite company and had them build um, this monument that um, is as megalithic in it as anything in Europe, and uh, he um, is paying for it. And the, the, most of the rules are nice, you know, unite humanity with a living new language, uh, rule with passion and reason, Avoid petty laws and useless officials. Um, we're not doing much of this yet. But no, we're not. Th there's ten of them all together. And um, outside of killing off six and a half billion people, um, there's, uh, there's nothing that I find wrong with them. Well, uh, of in, the, in your seven years of writing this book, what was the biggest surprise that you had? I mean, you must have, some of these things must have surprised you over seven years. I think I constantly turned up things on... Um, Shakespeare and people in the court, and uh, although I studied history and that's what I have my degree in, um, never went into like Elizabethan Elizabethan court at, um, at the rate that I did it this time around, and it just put um, a lot of personality into people that I just knew for the names. So um, mm -hmm. it was a lot of fun uh, doing it, and uh, surprises you know around every corner. Were there any disappointments? I think the only disappointment is the times that I couldn't find more on something. And uh, like I said, my cousin, you know, it's it's a load of uh, you know what. Um, <laughs> if I did, if I could point to a book that was this or that, and uh, that was written by someone else, um, you know, maybe eyes would open. I think it was Ignatius Donnelly that wrote yes. books on the coding of of Shakespeare, and it was like. You have to be a genius to put something like this together. Well, so it, it certainly wasn't William Shakespeare. Yeah, well, I, you know, do you think um, there's any, uh, you know, <laughs> it's going to be a kind of a stupid question, but I don't know what could ever move people when they get, when a corporation starts making big money off of certain things like Shakespeare, and, and um, not that he's still alive and he's making money, but, but, the whole the whole idea of what Shakespeare did and why people love him so much with these different plays, um, it you know it's 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 kind of to me. I don't know if anyone will ever really accept this unless they actually read the same kind of research that you and I have read. I agree. Yep. And it's uh, it's just sad, and it's very unfortunate, um, because uh, in my opinion, do you well? How do you feel about the success of what goes on in England in regards to to uh, Mr. Shakespeare and and the kind of things that that are uh, uh, celebrated there? Because every time we went there to uh, the United Kingdom, especially England, of course, uh, we had some very strange feelings about them. Hmm. Now, I've never been to Stratford, but uh, what I do feel that is the last generation just accepted things, 
and uh, and so then we went to a generation that questioned a lot of things. Now it seems with, especially with the young people that I talk to, um, talk about the Kennedy assassination or whatever. No, that couldn't be. The government wouldn't do that. <laughs> it's like uh, the government would, probably still does, and uh, I just, you know, I don't have the faith that everybody's always going to do the right thing. Well, yeah. So if we get a little bit less set in our ways and have an open mind that, um, you know, okay, maybe Bacon did write all of Shakespeare, um, I think we'd be better off. I believe so as well. Uh, but I, I, I just, uh, I know that as soon as I start to talk to other people about it, their eyes roll back and, <laughs> and, and, and you know, they, they fall, oh, look like they're falling asleep. Oh, I'm almost, hey, we're almost out of time here. Thank you for joining us, Stephen. I really appreciate it. I learned a great deal from you, and I hope to have you on again in the future, and I hope it won't be 16 years later. Thank you, Dr. Bob. You're very welcome. And next week, my friends, is Dr. Queen Zahara will be joining you. Isn't this true? Yes. Are we going to play who she's going to have on? Okay. Well, you are. Thank you. All right. We'll be seeing you two weeks from now. And I'll tell you who's going to be with us. We're going to be with my dear friend Stuart Zolotoro, who has an exhibit right now of his photographs of many rock and rollers that he and I have hung out with for a long period of time. And right now it's over at the Gordon Center. You should go over and take a look at it. It's, it's brilliant. It's wonderful. See you later. Stimulating talk and breaking news on Talk Radio 680 WCBM, Baltimore, and WCBM.com.